Everybody just turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Let me stop myself. You can stay right there, Winchell. Thank you. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just keep that open. Hallelujah. You guys can have your seats. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Can we give it up for our worship team and our band? They are doing an awesome job. Thank you, guys. Can we give it up for our students, our leaders, Brandon Robinson, our lead campus minister, Tim Burney, our assistant lead campus minister. Let's give it up for CJ, Osner, Zaire, everybody, Bree, everybody that's here. Hallelujah. You guys know that um, we have been in a series entitled The Kingdom of God is at Hand, and it's something that um, I believe that I'm going to be speaking on for every time you guys see me, okay? Um, I want to uh, commend Brandon. Let's just turn these down a little bit. I'm getting a little feedback. But um, I want to commend Brandon and Tim for continue to, continuing that series. Um, I didn't ask them to. Um, but you guys did a great job at um, um, further discussing what the Lord placed on my heart. Tonight, I really want to discuss something that you really won't hear much about. Um, it's really not something that you usually will hear at a college campus ministry either. Um, but if you guys have been paying attention to us or uh, my style of preaching and teaching, I'm usually going to touch on topics that are not really touched on a lot because I, I believe that I am called to uh, uh, really raise up leaders um, and to really bring a generation to the Lord, not to church, but bring a generation to the Lord. Um, and the way that we do that is by grounding everyone in the word of the Lord and what the Bible teaches, what the word of God says, not what a church says, not what a specific doctrine says, not what your denomination says, but what the word of the Lord says. So with that being said, um, you know what, how do I want to open this up, Lord? How should I go? You tell me. Mm -hmm. Let's just turn to 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. We're going to start with the reading of scripture. No, we're not. Go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, starting at verse 50. Actually, let me just open this up this way. So tonight I want to talk about uh, the resurrection. When we speak about the resurrection, we our mind automatically goes to when Jesus resurrected from the grave. But there's a resurrection that we all honestly should be looking forward to. The resurrection of the dead is when Jesus returns, the second coming, those who have died in faith. We're talking about the return of Jesus, right? So we, we, we walk through what it means, what it is, and all that stuff. Um, now I kind of want to deal with a little bit more of the specifics. Am I saying that right? Specific? You guys hear that S? Okay. All right, so I want to deal a little bit more with the specifics of his return. And the Bible lets us know, you can read a little bit more in First and Second Th Thessalonians, but it lets us know that when Jesus returns, that those who died in faith will rise from the grave. Okay? Um, and they will rise, and they will be changed, and then they will go to meet Jesus in the air. But they won't they won't go meet Jesus ahead of those who are still living. Okay? So what's, so I want to give you a picture. So Jesus comes, boom, right? He comes, and those who are alive are automatically changed. Okay? And then they go and meet Jesus in the air. Those who died in faith 
will rise from the grave, be changed, and go and meet Jesus in the air. What I find interesting, uh, interesting about the great resurrection is that uh, it's, it literally looks like what happened at Jesus' crucifixion. And no one really talks about this, and no one really points th- uh, 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 this out. But what I love about Jesus is that he always gives us a glimpse of what is to come in his present. And almost every step of the way, let's go back. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And everybody's looking at him like, what are you talking about? It took years for them to build this temple. Ain't no way you building up this, this building in three days. And Jesus is like, that's not even what I'm talking about. But they got it when what he was talking about actually happened. We see it so often when he's teaching parables. We see it so often when he's, when he's um, 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 explaining things to the, the disciples. We see him constantly showing... Showing them, what would we call it in literary terms? Foreshadowing. He's showing them ahead of time, pay attention to this. Because this is going to get you ready for that. When Jesus, you know what, let's just go to the passage of scripture. Go to Matthew 27. We, we, we shall all be there, right? Matthew 27, starting at verse 50. Then Jesus shouted out again. This is him on the cross dying. Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. It doesn't say that somebody came and opened the tomb. It said that tombs open, and it doesn't define whose tomb open. It doesn't say that them who died in faith tombs open. It just said, and tombs opened, right? Let's continue reading. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. So you can, being that they didn't give us names here, you can kind of just take your, your liberty there and start thinking about the different prophets and, and leaders of the faith that, that died before Jesus came. And they could have possibly been among them that rose from the dead. Okay? The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. What's very interesting about this passage of scripture is that it goes from, it goes from um, um, current to future back to current. Jesus dies on the cross. Boom. Boom. The dead rise. And then there's a little comma there, and they left and they left the grave after Jesus' resurrection. Well, Jesus is still on the cross at this time. Why did you feel the need to tell us that they left after he resurrected while you're still walking us through his res- his crucifixion? At Jesus' death, all of the the, the them who fell asleep in faith rose from the dead, but they didn't leave the grave until Jesus resurrected. They didn't walk out from the grave until Jesus resurrected. And there's a whole bunch that I I would love to say there, and it's really great preaching content right there, but I don't feel the need to do that right now because then we'll be here all night, but we're not going to do that. They, They had to wait for Jesus to resurrect first, in order for them to walk out of the grave. I know for some of you guys, you may not have heard this ever before, but it's right here in the Bible. We read it right there in Matthew, right? So, so, so they didn't leave the grave until Jesus resurrected. Jesus' resurrection was his release to them that were bound. Jesus' resurrection freed them that were, that were, that were, that were bound to the laws of death. What I find so sad about Christianity in America is that our culture, our American Christian culture, really honestly teaches us that Jesus did not overcome death. That's kind of a hard statement to make, isn't it? How many of us believe that when someone dies... That they go, if they're saved and they die in faith, 
that they go to heaven. Most of the American church believes that when someone dies, that they immediately enter into the kingdom of God. That they immediately, and they go back to when Jesus was speaking to the thief on the cross, he looked at him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the only time that we hear this term paradise all throughout the Bible. What's paradise? I want to walk you, I kind of wanted to walk you through a little bit of Christian history, but I'm not going to do that. But paradise, I'm going to give you my thought, okay? You guys go study and look this up yourself. There's a reason why the early church coined a phrase called rest in peace, R.I.P. Because the early church, and it is my belief, that when we die here on earth, that we enter into a rest. We are literally resting in peace. When Jesus looked at the thief on the cross and said, today you will be with me in paradise, I truly believe that Jesus was telling him, you are now getting ready to enter into a rest. And them who die in faith fall asleep in the presence of God. Is that not paradise? But our Christian, our American Christian culture teaches us that when someone dies, they go to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible does teach a judgment day. I think I'm going to do that the next time I get up. We're going to talk about judgment day. But the Bible teaches that no one will enter into their eternity until judgment day comes. It doesn't say that there's several judgment days. So everybody doesn't have a separate judgment day. There is one judgment day. And when judgment day comes, that determines where you will spend eternity. And if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you will, you will spend eternity with him. So if judgment day hasn't come yet, what happens to those who are who passed away in this earthly realm. I believe that they are resting, awaiting the time of the great resurrection. When you enter into the mindset that when we die, that I immediately go into heaven, or if I'm not saved, I immediately go to hell. Well, let's not even talk about that. I'm saved, if I immediately go into heaven, then where along the lines did Jesus overcome death? Because if he overcame death, that means, and I'm really jumping ahead of myself, if he overcame death, that means death no longer has a sting, which means that I don't have to go through a death process anymore. Am I making sense here? Am I make, making sense? Let's, let's go to um, 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. Because I know this is a lot of information, and I love doing this stuff to you guys because it makes you go read your Bible. All right? So <laughs> go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 and 12. If I have to submit to the way of death, then did Jesus really overcome death? 1 Corinthians chapter, what did I say? 15 and 12. There we go. All right. But tell me this, since we preached that since we preached that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. 
He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. He is the what? The first of a what? Great harvest of all who have died. Jesus died to prepare the way that we are supposed to go. Jesus' crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension is all a living example of what is to come. He's showing us that this is the way. Because I did what I did, you no longer have to submit and stay bound in death. I, I, I took this thing out of death. So you don't have to be afraid of death because when you die, rest assured that you're getting up. I feel like I'm about to start preaching. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ. Has Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. For the believer, death is not the final stage. Death is not the final option. As a matter of fact, just like Jesus overcame death, we too will overcome death. That's why in our spiritual lives, it's, 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 it's easy for us to get back up from death situations because that's something that's on the inside of us. When we get knocked down, it's easy for us to get back up because the truth of the matter is that what I deal with in this present life is nothing compared to me overcoming death. If I overcome death, then you best believe I'm going to overcome every temptation that the devil throws at me. You best believe I'm going to overcome every fight, every struggle, every hardship that the devil throws at me. Because he's nothing compared to death. Because if I die out of faith, my eternity, the, the eternity that I would spend in hell, it's actually torment for the devil. But because I have faith in Jesus, I overcome what's going to take the devil out. I overcome what the devil can't stand. I overcome what the devil is trying to, 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 to really, really elongate so he doesn't have to go. I'm getting too happy. To say that I enter into heaven immediately after death is to say that Jesus did not overcome. Because if Jesus overcame, there's a, that he made a way for me to go and he already showed us how to do it. So those who die in faith are sleeping. But what I love about this is that when we rise, Jesus... Thank you, Holy Ghost. When we rise from the dead, when we rise from the dead, the Bible lets us know that we are changed. Our bodies are glorified. Where have we seen a glorified Bible in the Bible? Jesus. The Bible says that when Jesus rose from the grave, that his body was glorified. And once we got to the point of his glorified body, we started to realize that he can walk through walls. See, what people, this understanding of when I die, my spirit goes to to heaven, is actually antichrist. Because that's a pagan belief. That comes from like Greek mythology um, and a whole bunch of other pagan beliefs. They believe in their spirit leaving their body. When the Lord created us, he created us a whole being already. Jesus rose from the dead physically. His body was glorified physically. And he ascended into heaven physically. Literally, Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of God the Father with a physical body. It's, it's not, he's not a ball of light. 
physical body, when we rise from the grave, when we, when we, when we, when we are glorified, we're going to have a physical body. We're going to look like ourselves. Why is it important to understand the resurrection? Because how you see the future, how you see what's going to come, helps you to live right now. It helps you to, it helps you to really put things in the proper perspective. You wouldn't be so easy to give up and quit on things when you realize that you're overcoming death. The, one of the most horrific things to ever experience in our earthly life, uh, losing a loved one. You as a believer are overcoming that. What the devil himself will have to succumb to. Eternal death. Like, death here on earth is not eternal death, okay? Like, my mindset about death... Um, has always been different because of my study on um, the study of eschatology, um, Christian eschatology. Let me say that Christian eschatology has changed my mind. So when people die, like it's, it is a loss, but people will, will notice that I don't really cry at a lot of um, funerals and stuff because I don't really feel sad, especially if it was a believer. Now, for somebody who wasn't saved, it kind of hurts, you know. And I just hope that they profess faith in the Lord at some point in their life, you know? So, but as a believer, we shouldn't be afraid of death. And if you get that in your mind, if you really focus on that, you'll understand the strength that the apostles ministered from. We get upset about Mercy College not letting us on campus. Okay, well, we're not being boiled in a pot for the gospel, you know. <laughs> we're not being boiled like a hot dog, you know. They're not letting us have our conference on campus. Well, they also are not crucifying me upside down. I'm also not getting beat. The apostle Paul got beat up so bad that he pretty much died. He died. And the, the, his, his fellow brothers gathered around him. And that Bible doesn't even go too much into exactly what happened. All they did was crowd around him. And he just got up. How many of us have been beaten for the gospel? They were able to withstand all the pain, the injury, the loss, everything that they dealt with. They were able to withstand it because they knew that there was greater ahead. You can just, you just help me out. I like when you come in and play at the end of my message. You make me sound even more important. Thank you. <laughs> they were able, our forefathers were able to go through what they went through for the gospel. Because they knew what was coming was greater than what, where they were. They knew that what they were doing was going to create a whole movement that expanded across the entire world. Can you imagine a small group of people starting something in the Mediterranean area and now it's all across the world with different denominations. Like some people look at denominations and all this stuff as, you know, negative and everything. I understand why, but at the same time, like you got all these different groups of people believing the same thing differently that's dope and they were only able to do it because they had their eyes fixed on his return what has your attention what are you are you so focused on school that you forget the return of Christ? Are you so focused on your issues that you forget that Jesus is coming back? Instead of tending to your needs, instead of tending to your, your mental... I struggle with this too. There's times where, I, listen, we've been, we've been doing help for 10 years. 
And I've been in ministry for at least two to three years before we started help. Sometimes I get to the point where I'm like, Lord, I gave you my whole life. Some days I just want to go to Barbados and stay out there for a year without having to worry about putting a sermon together. And all. Like those are things that come to my mind. And I'm sure those are things that come to you guys as mind. I'm getting tired of coming here and doing Bible study. I just want to be in my room. I just want to do my homework. I just want to, I get it. But what's more important to you? Preparing for his coming or attending to your right now needs? I get that life is hard. The Bible tells us that life is going to be hard. Warns us, your days are going to be hard. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. The Bible says that. I know life is hard. I know things don't go according to plan. But are you preparing yourself for his return? Are you preparing yourself to see Jesus? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. His return is soon. There is a great resurrection coming when he returns. And I just want to ask you this simple question. Will you be amongst them that will rise to meet him in the air? Will you be amongst them whose bodies will be glorified? What I love about the great resurrection is that all the people that died in faith that I miss, I'm going to be able to see them again. That's one of the things I love about it. My aunt passed away a few years ago, and she was the one that raised me in church. The reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because of her. And I remember when she passed away. I was This when I was producing in the city, and I got a phone call at work. She just got sick suddenly, like just in two days. She got sick suddenly. I get a call at work. I was planning some interviews and stuff like that, and my mother said, Freedom, you need to jump on the Metro North and get to the hospital as soon as possible. And I remember how nervous I felt because I didn't know what was going on. I didn't even know it was that serious. I stepped off the elevator in the hospital. As soon as my foot crossed the threshold of the elevator, I heard my entire family go up screaming. And immediately I walked around the corner and they all looked at me. And my mom came up to me and was like, I guess she was waiting for you. And at the moment, I felt a great pain because I'm like, I wanted her to see me get licensed. I wanted her to see me get ordained. I wanted her to see the help ministries uh, grow and become what, it, what, I, what I envisioned. I, I, want, I wanted to be able to sit down with her and talk to her about the things that I deal with in ministry. I wanted to hear her wisdom. Besides her, there was nobody else in my family that, was, that goes to church. Or that was a devout follower. But the one thing that encouraged me in that moment was that I was going to see her again. That's one of the things I love about the great resurrection. I'm going to see my aunt again. You're going to see whoever you lost again. Yes, we're excited about seeing Jesus. I'm not taking any attention away from him. But just think about all these different aspects that come along with the great resurrection. You're going to be changed. You're going to see Jesus. You're going to spend eternity with him. You're going to see your loved ones that passed in the faith. And there's even more than that we, we don't have time to dive into. Will you be ready for that day? Will you be ready for that day? The resurrection is necessary. If you're watching this broadcast right now, and you may not understand everything that I'm talking about, and that's okay. We gave you some scripture. You can go read it, study it. For those of you guys that are 
would really like to deeply look into that topic is honestly do a simple Google search on Christian eschatology. I love the website karm.org, C-A-R-M.org. They give you a lot of information and resources and stuff like that for you to learn about different Christian principles and, and all that good stuff and apologetics. Go ahead. But for those of you that are watching and you're saying, I really would love to be a part of that resurrection to see Jesus, that I would love to spend eternity with him. If you're watching this broadcast right now and you don't know where you will spend eternity, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. You can change the outcome of your future in just one moment. I don't care who you are. You could be Muslim. You could be Hindu. You could be an atheist. You could be agnostic. You could be whatever. It's, it's okay. This ministry has brought a lot of different people to Christ. I believe in this gospel message. Whatever it is that you believe, it's whatever. But if you want to spend eternity with Jesus, I just want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Father, I thank you for life, for mercy, for grace. I come to you acknowledging that I am a sinner. I have done wrong. I have messed up. I have fallen short of your will. I ask, Lord, that you will forgive me. And I confess right now that I choose to repent. I choose to turn my back on my sin. I choose to change my mind about my sin. I'm right. I'm not right. You're right. Forgive me, Lord. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe that your son Jesus came down and died on the cross for me. I believe that your son Jesus rose from the grave for me. And I believe that he is coming back for me. Save me. Make me yours. And fill me with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, either it was your second or third time or whatever time or whether it was your first time, I just want to let you know that you are now saved. If you prayed that, meaning it from your heart, the Bible says that you are saved. That when Jesus comes back for his church, when he comes back for his followers, that you will be counted among them. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to please contact us at helpministries10 at gmail.com. We want to reach out to you. We want to pray with you. And we want to help you along the first steps of this new journey. All right. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study. Our worship team is getting ready to bring us back into some some more worship. Please join in with us and please make sure you contact Contact us. For those of you guys that desire prayer, contact us, please. We would love to pray with you. All right? Let's hand it back over to our worship team.
that I I pray very often. Um, whenever I really feel led, I always I, which is pretty often. I pray this prayer very often. I quiet myself and I literally turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I give you my life as a sacrifice. This life that I live is not my own, but it's yours. If you're watching this right now, if you're watching this right now and you desire to really give your life more to the Lord, I want you to just tap into this right here. Come on, tap into this right here. Come on. Come on, take my life, Lord. Take my life as a Come on, take this moment to sac- to lay your life down. joining us. We're so glad to have you. We'll see you guys next week. You guys have a great night. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stop recording. I feel like we got to tarry here real quick. Let's just spend time in his presence real quick. We'll be out of here. I know it's late.